church has professed its faith in creeds, and we're going to sing one such creed this morning based on the Apostles' Creed.
section of scripture this morning. Several years ago, I got up on Mother's Day to do children's message, and I talked about my two favorite mothers in the Bible. The first one was Elizabeth, and the second one is our scripture lesson for today. The children didn't know who Elizabeth and Hannah were, and it kind of discouraged me about what we we're teaching our children because when I was a little girl who grew up, we had a Bible story as our Sunday school lesson, and I learned about these women. And I'm so proud of my taking the up taking this month of January and speaking about five daughters and three other women and only including David in this script, uh, session in this month. So our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 through 18. There was a certain man from Ramatham, a Zuphite from the hill countries of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jerobin, the son of Elahu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Pinia. Pinia had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for El Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Pinia, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my grief, anguish, and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. <coughs> the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Sometimes when you work, you get the benefit of seeing amazing things happen. 
So as I was here this week, and I guess as I'm the pastor of the church, this is where I work. As I was here on Tuesday, there was a knocking at the door. Linda had gone home, Marion wasn't here, no one else was around. There's a banging at the door, and there's a young man standing at the door over there. And I didn't know who he was, I'd never seen him before. I opened the door, and he said to me this, Is this the church that visits the laundromats? Now, for those of you that don't know, we have a team of people that visit laundromats on Saturday mornings, taking with them uh, quarters in order to uh, feed the washing machines there to help folks out that are there washing their clothes. We pay for their uh, laundry to be done and have conversation whilst that laundry is done. Well, I kind of looked at him and went, yes. And he said, I own one of the laundromats in town. He said, I want to give some money towards that. Here's a check. And so the evangelism committee that coordinate the laundromat ministry now have 800 more quarters to go and fill a few more washing machines around the city. Man, I was proud of that. Not proud from a prideful point of view. But the fact that we as a congregation are working together in the service of Jesus and it's being noticed. People are noticing the witness of Christ in our community. So that was a good thing about work, but that got me thinking about other work that I've done uh, as a, a person in my life. Well, my first job right out of high school was picking apples in an apple orchard, and I didn't enjoy that. It was hard work, and friends, these hands don't deserve to have calluses on them, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> The great big sack around my neck, up on trees day after day, up on ladders in trees day after day, picking apples, and, and I hated it. I lasted an impressive three weeks picking apples, which I was told was like 30 years in a gold watch. <laughs> but I was completely miserable those entire three weeks. My arms were scratched up. I fell off the ladder more times than I care to uh, mention. My back was killing me, and the accommodations were sparse. We have the Super 8 motel chain, right? I was staying at the Super Half. <laughs> and if I never pick another apple in my lifetime, it will be too soon. I did not enjoy picking apples, which you know, picking apples is not the worst job in the world. Compared to some jobs, it's like sitting in an air-conditioned room on the couch being fed peeled grapes by your manservant. NBC actually put together in 2014 a list of the 10 most stressful jobs in the United States of America. These aren't necessarily the worst jobs, these are the most <laughs> stressful jobs. And I thought it would be interesting to take a look at that list this morning. At number 10, a corrections officer, someone who works in the prisons. I can understand why that would be a pretty stressful job. At number 9, firefighters. Number 8, and I'm glad I'm not out on Wednesday morning when the truck rumbles down Waterman Avenue. Garbage collectors. At number seven on their list, flight attendants had a stressful job. I've been on some stressful flights before, and I've just been the passenger. At number six, a chef, a head chef, more to the point. Now, I don't know about you, but I've watched plenty of programs featuring Gordon Ramsay, and I understand why it would be stressful working in a kitchen under the likes of a person like that. At number five, and this is what I kind of used to do after I picked apples, a broadcaster was one of the most stressful jobs in North America. At number four, a taxi driver. In at number three, an enlisted member of the military was considered one of the most stressful jobs. At number two is a newspaper reporter. And the number one most stressful job in North America, a lumberjack. Leaping from tree to tree. It makes me want to burst out into a Monty Python song. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. I sleep all night and I work all day. Now, these jobs are not necessarily dirty jobs. They're the most stressful jobs in North America. But there's one particular job in the world that I think kind of, it's, it, it has to be, at least in my thinking, the most stressful, the most disgusting, and the most dirty job you could ever imagine. And it's a job that several Australians are employed in. Thanks to Bonnie this week, she gave me the idea of exactly where I was going this morning in this morning's sermon. I think the worst job in the world would to be a sewage diver. You heard me right. 
a sewage diver. We deal with human waste a little differently in Australia. There are some places in the United States that work this way too, at least where it's warmer, not here. But we deal with it a little differently. Now, if you think, Mike, human waste is not a topic for church on Sunday morning, I want to draw your attention to the book of Deuteronomy, the 23rd chapter, and reading from verse 12. You are to have a place outside the camp where you can go and relieve yourself. Carry a stick as part of your equipment so when you have a bowel movement, you can dig a hole and cover it up. It is there in black and white in the Holy Scriptures, the book of Deuteronomy. So I figured that's a good enough reason to include this kind of stuff in church on Sunday morning. Anyway, in parts of Australia, instead of piping sewer water to an indoor sewage treatment plant, we rely on the great outdoors. Great big large open air sewer pits where the wastewater is dumped and then consistently churned by machinery with bacteria, special bacteria added, to break down the wastewater into a sludge. And then the sludge is kind of poured out into fields, allowed to dry, and then kind of minced up and we make a fertilizer for crops and, and other things. And the water that is also a byproduct of this process is cleaned and then sent back as grey water into homes. And by that I mean to flush toilets, to water gardens and the like. Most sewer treatment plants <coughs> in the world can actually clean water cleaner than when it first went in you. But we kind of have that mental block in our heads that says don't send it back in our pipes for us to drink again. Anyway, in the city of Adelaide, which is the capital city in my home state, there are three such open-air sewage treatment plants, and one of them is in a suburb of Adelaide called Bolivar. You can imagine when a certain child of mine was an infant that we had some fun. <laughs> Bolivar Oliver, where we were changing his diapers. Here's an overhead picture of that plant. I want you to kind of take a look. So if you see those round circles on the screen, they're the open air pits. They have big churning machinery inside of them that churn up the wastewater and help it break down with the aid of bacteria. Now, sometimes machinery breaks down. What are you going to do when those big churning pieces of equipment break down? Well, if you're Brandon Walsh, you get to be a sewage diver. And I have a picture of Brandon, and yes, that is exactly what you think it is. Isn't this kind of job enough to make your stomach just turn? I had someone at the first service that kind of started chuckling because they had worked in a sewer treatment plant for years and they thought this was hilarious. Now, Brandon says he quite enjoys his job, but it is not a job that I would want to do. In fact, this has to be, in my head, the worst job ever possible. I think it was Bonnie this week that said that if she won Powerball, she'd pay for this guy never to have to dive in sewage again. And I kind of thought, but what about the poor next guy that had had to come and take Brandon's place? You can take it back to the slide. I think I'm done talking about sewer. <laughs> and I'm talking about it for this particular reason. Hannah, from 1 Samuel chapter 1, is essentially, for all intents and purposes, a sewer diver. And I don't mean that she works with human wastewater. I mean that she's seen with such disgust and such horror and such disfavor. And the reason she's seen this way is because she's childless. Now in this day and age, praise God, we no longer measure the worth of a woman by whether or not she can have children. But around 3,000 years ago, when this story was unfolding, a woman's worth was tied to her fertility, and even more so to her ability to produce sons. And it's only been in recent years, and I mean decades, not hundreds of years, it's only been in recent years that we're finally emerging out the other side of this very dark age idea that a woman's worth is tied to childbirth. Even if we trace our own theological heritage back a few hundred years, we find that the Methodist Church comes out of a movement that began about a woman's ability to have a child. Now, if you know some of your church history, you know that King Henry VIII was married to Catherine of Aragon. 
And Catherine gave birth to one child, Mary, who later became Queen Mary, but Henry wanted a son. And so he thought, the only way I'm going to get a son is to divorce Catherine of Aragon and marry somebody else. So he asked the Pope for a divorce, and the Pope said, are you kidding, buddy? No. So King Henry, long story short, split the English Catholic Church off from the Roman Catholic Church and began the Anglican Church, or what we know today as the Episcopal Church in North America. And he did so because if he controlled the church, he knew he could get a divorce. And he got his divorce from Catherine of Aragon. Then he married Anne Boleyn, didn't like her much, cut off her head. Married someone else, didn't like her, cut off her head too, married someone else. And just went through cutting off several people's heads after that. But John Wesley was a priest within King Henry's Church of England. And we come out of that movement. So just a few hundred years ago, we, in our own church movement, were still saying a woman's worth is tied to whether or not she can have children. Hannah, the scripture says, was one of two wives of Elkanah. There was Peninnah, and Peninnah was able to have children. She had produced already for Elkanah sons and daughters, the scripture says, but Hannah wasn't able to have kids. And Penina used that to her advantage. As the story goes, as I kind of contemporize it in my own head, Penina used her Facebook account and her Instagram photos and her Yelp reviews and her Twitter feed to taunt and harass and tease and verbally vomit all over Hannah. So much so that Hannah stops eating. <coughs> Hannah starts weeping in anguish and in grief. This is flat out bullying, right? Bullying usually occurs when one person thinks they have the goods on somebody else. Where one person's personal opinion matters more than truth. Now, Penina's opinion was this. Hannah can't have kids. Therefore, Hannah must be worthless. But was that actually true? Well, we'd like to say, no, no, that's not true. Hannah wasn't worthless. But Hannah believed what was being said. For Hannah, it may not have been actual truth, but in that circumstance, it was true to her. Hannah believed that she was worthless, useless, no good, without hope. Hannah, for all intents and purposes, becomes the equivalent of a sewer diver not worth a whole lot in our own minds, occupying a space that I don't think any of us would willingly want to occupy anytime soon. And here's what troubles me about the story of Hannah and Peninnah and Elkanah from 1 Samuel. Nothing has changed in 3,000 years. Nothing's changed. Now, the issue may not be today whether a woman can or cannot have children. Today, the issue is if my brother or my sister belongs to a different political party than I do, then they are wrong and their opinion is worthless. If my brother or my sister has a different theological understanding about something in the Bible than I do, then they are wrong and they are essentially a heretic and perhaps even heading downstairs to the other place. If my brother or my sister has a life style that I disagree with, then they are worth nothing. Nothing's changed in 3,000 years. Because instead of loving like Jesus, sometimes we hate like Penina did. We become shells of the people we're supposed to be, more concerned with getting a leg up in the community, or in the church, or in our workplace where the rich simply get richer and the poor get trodden upon. Now, folks got all excited about the Powerball this uh, last couple of weeks, but if you ever stop to think what the Powerball might actually do or what lottery sometimes does in our community, this isn't me standing up here rag railing against the lottery, I just want to talk about what it can have the potential to do. Now, you've probably seen the commercials on television that says, wow, the lottery is good for us because the money that's raised goes into schools and infrastructure and roads and things like that. Well, consider this. When North Carolina introduced the lottery just 10 years ago, 
the lottery in Illinois was introduced in 1974, but uh, in North Carolina just 10 years ago, they announced that 100% of the proceeds of the lottery would go towards schools in that state. And do you know what? They delivered on the promise. 100% of all of the proceeds from the lottery in the state of Calif uh, North Carolina goes to schools and education, except the North Carolina legislature, legislators first cut the education department budget by 12%. And then they let the lottery money make it up. That ain't helping education. That isn't giving teachers a pay rise. That isn't improving schools. That isn't improving children's education. That's just lining your own pocket. See, sometimes the rich get richer and the poor just get trodden on. I couldn't find out exactly where the money goes in Illinois. Not <laughs> education. But I can hazard a guess I know. The lottery is a classic example sometimes of something that can oppress desperately poor people. The promise of such riches. Someone goes and spends their grocery money or their money for the Ameren Light Bill or something like that in the, in the hope, in the vain, tiny hope that they might just win. And if they might just win, they'll get up out of the hole that they're in. But of course, most of the time, they then don't have the money for groceries or the money for rent or the money to pay the light bill. The rich get richer off the backs of the poor. Penina trampled all over Hannah in this way. She made herself look bigger because she had the goods on Hannah. She succeeded in breaking Hannah's spirit and crushing Hannah's hopes. So where does Hannah go to? Well, Hannah goes to the church, a place where many of us might actually go to when we feel like that our hopes have been dashed and our dreams have been crushed. And what help does Hannah initially get from the church? Well, not much. Eli, the crooked priest, takes one look at this woman and he thinks, she's drunk. Hmm. Not only does Hannah experience the jackboot of Penina on her neck, she experiences the church say, you're worth nothing. You're a worthless drunk. How dare you even come into the church? But what's interesting to note is Hannah's response. See, Hannah could have spat in Eli's face and said, you idiot, I'm not drunk. But she doesn't. Hannah could have responded to the jaunts and the jeers of Penina, but she doesn't. Instead, Hannah just simply places what's left of her broken spirit in the hands of God. Not the church, not the priest, not her friends, although they were probably numbered in few, but in God. And here's what Hannah says, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but to give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. You know, before Hannah had even prayed that day, God had answered her prayer. Because God always has an answer. It may not be revealed to us when we pray seeking that answer, but God always has an an answer. And God had an answer for Hannah before she even prayed this prayer. And God's answer was twofold. It was two children. Now you might be thinking, hang on Mike, I've read 1 Samuel 1. Hannah does not have two children. She only has one. Incorrect. God's answer is two children, not one. Two children. And it didn't come by way of a Facebook message or a Twitter feed. God's answer didn't come by a proclamation in the city square. God's answer didn't come from a bishop, a district superintendent, a pastor, or a lay leader. It didn't come from the active lay people in the church. God's twofold answer was to confound them all because God's answer was two boys. Two boys, one a prophet and one a king. Two boys. A son for Hannah, and not just any boy, a prophet. A prophet who would prepare 
for a king, not just King Saul. And not just King David, whom Samuel anointed, the eighth son of Jesse, to be a king. Samuel was called to point towards God's bigger answer by anointing David in the line of Jesse. Samuel is pointing directly to the one who would be called Emmanuel, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Two boys. God lifted up that broken, hopeless, downtrodden, shoved aside woman and gave her a purpose. Granted her meaning, gave Hannah status, conferred upon her significance. No longer was Hannah some forgotten woman without a kid. Hannah became the mother of a prophet who woke up the nation of Israel. Because Israel had fallen asleep. Israel didn't know what time of day it was. Israel had forgotten who God was. Israel's priests were crooked and corrupt because Eli and his sons were a bunch of work. And God's going to deal with them in the next few chapters of 1 Samuel. Samuel, this boy, is born to remind people that a king is coming. You know, the narrator of Samuel's story says in the third chapter that at the time of Samuel's birth and early childhood that the word of the Lord was rare and visions weren't plentiful. The people had forgotten God. Samuel is born into corruption. The church was so knee deep in those sewage pits themselves. Eli and his sons were not faithful. Folks have lost faith in God and in the church, but not Hannah. Not Hannah. Despite everything that came against this woman, from Penina and likely others as well, the insults and the lies and the slurs and the humiliation, God rose up and restored her and used Hannah to bear a prophet. Not just a prophet, but used Hannah, if you excuse my play around with language here, used Hannah to bear a prophet and participate in the preamble and the prelude of the one prophesied to be the Prince of Peace. That's what God was doing. Hannah's song, I would imagine, prior to the birth of Samuel, would have been a hard song. Maybe like the words we heard earlier, that's me in the corner, that's me in the spotlight, losing my religion. Trying to keep up with you, Penina. And I don't know if I can do it. Huh. I've said too much. I haven't said enough. I thought I heard you laughing. I thought I heard you cry. I don't even know who I am anymore. But Hannah has a follow-up song for losing my religion. <clears throat> and Hannah's follow-up song happens in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And she sings a wholly different song. A song with these words, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My strength rises up in the Lord. My mouth mocks my enemies because I rejoice in your deliverance. No one's holy like the Lord. No one, no one except you. There is no rock like our God. God raises the poor up from the dust, lifts up the needy from the garbage pile. God sits them with officials and gives them the seat. I recognize that song. Isn't that kind of the song that, that Mary sang? My soul doth magnify the Lord. Two sons, two promises, one to point to a king, and the king himself. You see, Hannah's story, some 3,000 years ago in the past, maybe longer, and a story is not just a story for three millennium ago. It's a story for us even now. It's a story of movement from sewer diver to prophet mother, from hopeless to hopeful, from garbage to glory. Hannah's story is the song of the Christian church from death 